I'm gonna share the screen. Great, thank you. Okay, now we have it here. Okay, good. Okay, so let me take you back to the sugya that we were studying um, last week. What I like about this sugya is that it's short and it's easy from a sugya of this nature to understand rabbinic thinking and the way the hachamim approached um, um, the study of uh, various topics. Not just how they packaged it, but what was the intellectual process behind um, uh, these matters. So I'm just gonna open up my notes, as I do have notes uh, that I take before I come to this class. So give me a moment to find it. Okay, good, we're ready. So just to refresh your memory, we were dealing with the question of Edim that testify that a particular debtor owed money to a lender and the money had to be paid back in 30 days. In reality, that was just a lie. The money had to be paid back in 10 years. And the Mishnah said that what is the penalty that the Adim Zomimim have to pay? The penalty is the amount of the brokerage fee, let's call it, that the lender would need to pay in order to secure a loan of 10 years, right? Because that's really what he's losing. He's losing that brokerage fee. So that was the Mishnah, and we did that last week. I want to go back to the Gemara, and um, I just want to read what we read last week just so that we're back in um, with, the, with the text of the Gemara. So with your permission, I'm going to read it now. It's Amar Avi Huda. It's here. Okay. All right. So here goes. Amar Avi Huda, Amar Shemuel. Hamalve et havero le aisev shanim shebi'id meshametato. So this was the statement of Shemuel. Shemuel, the famous Shemuel, the Rosh Hashivah Nehal De'ah, the great expert in Dine Mamonot. He's dealing here with the matter of Dine Mamonot. Um, so this is his expertise. And he makes the following statement. He says, if there's a 10-year loan, the Shevi'it annuls that loan. And you will recall that last week, I raised the following, or I pointed out the, the, to the following thing being intimated by Shemuel. When Shemuel chooses a 10-year loan, he's intimating our Mishnah. He's referring to our Mishnah, because our Mishnah also has a 10-year loan. So what's he trying to say? What is Shemuel saying about our Mishnah? So, so he's saying something very specific. And by the end of today, tonight, we're going to finish this sugya. And we're going to understand what Shemuel's point was about the Mishnah. But just for now, let's put that question on hold, okay? The statement, now let's look at the actual statement of Shemuel. The statement of Shemuel is that if there was a 10-year loan, when the sabbatical year arrives, the sabbatical year annuls the loan. Um, you would think, well, perhaps... Perhaps it doesn't annul the loan. Why not? So that now, now the Gemara is going to explain the statement of Shemuel. You notice the statement, uh, the, the initial statement itself was in Hebrew, and now the further elaboration, which is a summary of the class that took place in the yeshiva, that further elaboration is going to be in Aramaic. The Afalgav de la Karenan lo yigos ate lide lo yigos. Now, the reason that the Torah sets forth for, one second, the reason that the Torah sets forth the rule of the seventh year, the sabbatical annuls all loans, the reason for that is specified in the Torah. It says, lo yigos, right? That's the rule. 
No egos means you shall not oppress. Um, the Torah doesn't want a society where people are financially oppressed. Now, there is a pasuk that says, Kilo yahdal elyon ha'ares. In, in that same parasha, actually, it says, in the same parasha of lo yigos, there's a pasuk that says, there will always be poor people in the world. So if there are poor people in the world, there will be financial oppression. That's clear. But the point is, there has to be a limit. Okay? A person cannot be financially oppressed forever. Right? And the purpose of the Shemitah years is to say, that's it. Atkan tehom Shabbat. There's a boundary. You know, there's a boundary. Okay, you oppress this poor guy. He couldn't pay back his debts. He's not a criminal. That's it. Seventh year comes. You annul the debt. That's lo yigos. But here's the question. Here is the ambiguity. The word lo yigos, you shall not oppress. Is that present tense? What tense is that? And we discussed this also last week. We said that according to this explanation of Shemuel, the word lo yigos is known, uh, the tense is known as a present future, meaning it's a continual present. It's not just a present now and then later on itself, but rather this continues further. So when the Torah mandates lo yigos, you shall not oppress, it's not just now. It's not just in the seventh year, but rather from the seventh year forward, there shall be no oppression, right? That's really important. It's important because if you give it that explanation, and that's the explanation that Shemuel gives it, it comes out that if you have a loan and the loan is not gonna be due till a couple or two or three, four years, five years after the sabbatical year, well, when the sabbatical year comes, you would say, well, we shouldn't annul the loan because there is no oppression. There is no financial oppression. There will be financial oppression in the future, but there's no financial oppress um, there is no financial oppression in the present, right? So by interpreting the word lo yigos as present future, what you're really saying is that the sabbatical year, it doesn't just annul loans that are due now, but it annuls all loans, even if they're going to be due in the future, right? That's the chidush of Shemuel. That's how Shemuel understands the pasuk. And I'm going to read it to you again. Even though hashta, hashta means at this moment, meaning in the sabbatical year, you cannot read the pasuk lo yigos. You cannot say, oh, you're oppressing him. You're not oppressing him. The loan isn't due now. It's a 10-year loan. It's a due in two, three years. Ateli de lo yigos. But there will be financial oppression in the future. And the purpose of the Shana Shemitah is to stop all present and all future financial oppression. Meaning if there are existing loans now, even if they're not due at the present moment, they're due in the future, comes the Shemitah, the loans are over. So that's the statement of Shemuel. The statement of Shemuel has nothing to do with our Mishnah. The only relationship between the statement of Shemuel and our Mishnah is that 10 years. That, that's like, where did that come from? And we'll see. We'll see where that came from. But in the meantime, we have the statement. Um, and now we are going to continue from where we left off uh, last week. Okay? And it is as follows. Metim Rab Kahana. First, the word Metim. The word Metim is a technical term. Um, and it has to do with the fact that in Aramaic, oftentimes you have the word, I'm sorry, the letter Taf instead of the letter Shin. So, for example, you have Tanu Rabbanan. What does Tanu Rabbanan mean? Tanu is an Aramaic word. Rabbanan is an Aramaic word. Rabbanan means the Hachamim. Tanu means if you switch the top, 
you switch it to a sheen, shanu rabbana. The rabbis um, would repeat the following halakha. They would recite the following halakha, meaning it was a formal halakha. Okay. What does metiv mean? What does the word metiv mean? So the word metiv is meshiv. Okay, meshiv. So let me explain to you what that means. Somebody makes a statement in the yeshiva. And I want to question the statement. So I have a reply. You made a statement. Now I'm going to reply to what you just said. But the word metiv is, is a technical term in the Gemara. And it's only used. This is a technical terminology. And it's important to understand the technical Aramaic terms in the Gemara. Otherwise, oftentimes you just don't understand what the sugya is talking about. So the word metiv is a technical term that means... I am now going to bring to you a higher source. Okay? A higher source. So metiv always means I'm going to reply to what you just said, but the reply is not just going to be my own personal opinion. You know, sometimes in politics, people have a lot of arguments back and forth, you know, and there's huffing and there's puffing and there's yes and there's no and maybe. and the, Okay, those are all personal opinions. Metiv means I'm not bringing your personal opinion. I'm bringing to you an authoritative source that you may not ignore. Okay? That's what the word metiv means. Now, Shemuel, he's the one who made the statement. Right? Amar Avihuda, Amar Shemuel. Remember? Whoops, sorry about that. Amar Avihuda, Amar Shemuel. By the way, do you see when I move my cursor on this shared screen, do you see it? Yes. Good. So you see, Amar Abid Amar Shemuel, Shemuel was an Emora. What can possibly be a higher source than Shemuel? He was the Rosh Hashiva Ibn Nehal De'ah. And the answer is a Tanaitic source. And that's exactly what Rav Kahana is going to do now. He is going to bring a Tanaitic source. And that Tanaitic source is going to present um, a problem for the statement of Shemuel. Rather, it is going to be a reply to the statement of Shemuel, which essentially shows that the statement cannot be accepted. Now you understand what the word metiv means? That's the meaning of the word metiv. So let's read, let's read now another thing. Rav Kahana. So he responds with a, with a, uh, a higher, uh, more authoritative text. Correct. He is going to present before the yeshiva an authoritative text, a source, um, which is going to basically present the problem to the previous uh, statement. The previous statement was that the Shemitah annuls also long-term debt that hasn't come due yet in the Shemitah year. The Shemitah annuls those loans. And he's going to bring a source that would seem to have it other uh, otherwise. Okay? Now, I want to say one more thing. Um, First generation, let's look at first generation in Moraim. The first generation in Moraim was perhaps, some may argue, the greatest generation of Moraim. Because these Moraim were Talmidim, or perhaps even, one would say, perhaps junior Talmidim of uh, Abbeinu HaKadosh. Abbeinu HaKadosh was the author or the editor of the Mishnah, not him alone, as one day we can discuss. It was Abbeinu HaKadosh Betino. Nevertheless, he was the author. Now, he had several Talmidim, one of them was Shemuel, the other was Rab. Now, these Emoraim were special Emoraim, okay? They were special Emoraim in that in some ways they also had the authority of Tanaim. That's for the subject for a future, um, a future discussion. But here's what you need to know. Rav Kahana was a Talmid Haver of Rav. Rav was Rosh Yeshiva Tzura. Now, when, um, when Rav was alive, Rav Yehuda, was the Talmud of Rab. When Rab died, Rab Yehuda went to Shemuel. He left Surah, which was one yeshiva in Babel. He went to Nehar De'a, another yeshiva in Babel, and he studied with Shemuel. Now, Rab Kahana was a Talmud Khaver of Rab, meaning he wasn't just a, you know, a regular Talmud. He was at a very high level because he used to argue with Rab and he used to have back and forth discussions. So Rab Kahana now is in the yeshiva of Shemuel, and he is going to question the statement of Shemuel. So I just wanted to set up for you. Who brings the statement? Amar Abihuda, Amar Shemuel, right? 
So I want you to see this. I want you to see how everything comes together in the point of geography and in the point of history. It's very precise. Okay. So Metiv Rav Kahana. Okay. Here goes. Omerim, the, the correct girsa is Omerim, the older girsa is Omerim. Um, this is a girsa of Arambam, this is a girsa of Dalif, this is a girsa of the Geonim. Where is it? I don't see it on the shared screen. Oh, yeah, because no, the shared screen, first of all, thank you for pointing that out. I forgot to move it up, so thank you. Metiv Rav Kahana, here it is. Omerim, not Omedim, Omerim, Kama Adam Roseli Ten. Right. Um, okay. Does anybody know what source Rav Kahana is bringing? What is this specific Tanaitic source that he is bringing? Does anybody recognize these words? Again, I'm going to read it for you. I'm going to read it for you. Omeri, Omerim, Kama Adam Roseliten. And I'm going to look at the correct Yirsa. Deyehe Elev Zuz, Deyado. Ben Notin al Mikan Vachelushim Yom. Ben Notin al Mikan Vachelushim Yom. Ben Notin al Mikan Vachelushim Yom. He's quoting our Mishnah. He's quoting our Mishnah. The Mishnah said that if Aydim Zomimim, they falsely testified that the defendant has a debt that's due in 30 days. It ends up, it was due in 10 years. Now, let's think about this for a moment. If the debt was due in 10 years, how much is the defendant losing when the Edim Zomimim falsely state, falsely testify that the debt is due in 30 days? How much are the Edim Zomimim losing? Who knows the answer? The, the expected value of, uh, the, one could say, profit that one would be able to make while, the, while holding that amount of money for 10 years minus 30 days. It's much simpler than that. You're making things really complex. Okay, sorry. Let me yeah. ask the question in another way. Mark, Isn't it zero? Mark, Mark, you wanted to say something? Yeah, no, you just take the fee that you would do for 10 years and subtract from it what you would do for 30 days. So you're, that's what we said. Well, I want to show you now that it's much simpler. Um, by the way, uh, Joe Chesky said the Mishnah, correct? I see the chat now, and I'll, I'll have it open. I, I think somebody said zero. Did anybody say zero just now? Yeah, that was me, Rabbi. Joe? Yes. Correct. It's zero. Why is it zero? Why would you have to pay zero? Because if it's due in 10 years and they want to testify it's due in 30 days, that there's, there's, it's not going to be, you know, forgiven. The loan is not going to be forgiven. It's still, so, am I? Exactly. Let, right. me, let me explain right. this. You're absolutely right, Joe. And I want to explain this to everybody. Remember what Shemuel just said? Shemuel said that if you have a 10-year loan, when the Shinata Shemitah comes, what happens to that 10-year loan? It's forgiven. Didn't we just say that? So if the loan is forgiven, it's a 10-year loan, is this person ever going to have to pay back the loan? No. By definition, the loan will be annulled, and should the person choose not to pay the loan, he will not be obligated to pay the loan. So if it was a $1,000 loan, and these Edim are coming and saying, oh, the loan is due in 30 days, when in reality it was due in 10 years, how much are they making him lose? They're making him lose $1,000. Because if it's a 30-day loan, he's going to have to pay $1,000. If it's a 10-year loan, he'll have to pay, what am I putting with my fingers? What number? Zero. Get it? Does everybody understand that? Or do I need to repeat it? Would yeah, you can repeat it. You want me to repeat it? Yes, please. Sure, of course, with pleasure. So let's look at the scenario again. The Aydin come, and this poor person, let's call this poor person Zebulun. Poor Zebulun owes money. 
$1,000. There's a note that says he owes $1,000. And the, uh, and, the, and the edim, I'm sorry, it's an oral loan. Let's just say it's an oral loan. Okay? He owes $1,000. The edim come and say that the loan is a 30-day loan. And therefore, in 30 days, he has to pay $1,000. The truth, it comes out, the Edim were liars. And the truth is that he would have to pay $1,000 in 10 years, not in 30 days. But here's the thing. If we take what Shemuel said as halacha, namely, what did Shemuel say? Shemuel said that, um, that the Shevi'it annuls loans which are not due now, but will be due in the future. That means that this 10-year loan will be annulled when the Shavit comes, by definition. And therefore, he would never have to pay the $1,000. So the Edim Zomimi made him lose $1,000. He would never have had to pay it. Now they have to pay it. Um, now he would have to pay it, if we accepted the testimony of the Edim Zomimi. So the point is, the, the, the She'ela of Rav Kana is very clever. And I'm going to point it now in the um, thing. If you accept the opinion of Shemuel that the Shevi'it, the sabbatical year, the seventh year, it annuls loans, even though they're not due now, they're going to be due in the future. Then the Aydim Zomimim would be obligated to pay the entire value of the note. If it's a thousand dollar loan, they would have to pay $1,000 back to the poor victim because that's how much he would have lost if he would have accepted their testimony. Understood? So it's a very strong question that Rav Kahana asks against Shemuel. And the question is from a higher source. It's from the Mishnah. It's from the Mishnah. Okay, give me one moment, please. Just one moment, please. Yahila, I apologize. So, um, okay, so that's the question. So we have again the statement of Shemuel, we have the Metivi of Rav Kahana, and now we're going to have the answer of Rava. We're going to read the answer now. Amar Ah, thank you. Sorry, I'm sorry. No, please, please, don't be sorry. Okay, it's over here. Amaraba. Thank you. By the way, Rabbi, you know how to get rid of the English there, right? On on Spadia? I don't. Oh, okay. So do you see where it says Aleph and A? Yeah, if you click that, and yes. you just click the Aleph by itself. Thank you very much. And you would also break it up. Um, click on it again, the Aleph A. Yeah. If you click the, see where it says layout? Yeah. The one on the right, if you click the one on the right, it, it breaks it up. Wow. Nice. Very nice. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Excellent. So, Amaraba. So, Raba answers the question. Now, before I even get to the answer of Raba, what's significant about Raba's answer? Who knows? What is significant about the fact? Well, I don't want to say about Raba's answer. That's not a fair way of putting it. What is significant about the fact that? Um, that it's Rava giving the answer. What's significant about that? Any any uh, takers? I'll explain to you what's significant. Shemuel was Dori Shon of the Emoraim. He was the first generation of the Emoraim. Rabbi Huda is Talmid, the one giving the class, was second generation of the Emoraim, together with Rav Kahana. Here's the thing. Rava was a fourth generation of the Kohanim, of the uh, Kohanim, he was a Kohen. Amoraim. <laughs> yeah, of the Amoraim. Oh, by the way, he, he uh, <laughs> um, um, apparently he was a Kohen, at least according to some sources, he was a Kohen. Nevertheless, 
um, Rava was the Rosh Yeshiva in Mechoza, okay, which was really a continuation of Yeshiva uh, from Medita, which was a continuation of the Yeshiva of Rav Yehuda, Nehar Da. The point is, the, 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 the reason I'm saying this is that here you have a very interesting historical process. And that historical process is, there was a statement by Shemuel, the Talmud of Shemuel, Shemuel is in the first generation, the Talmud of Shemuel, Rav Yehuda, he presents the statement in the yeshiva, and he gives a class about it, where he explains why Shemuel makes the Pesach that he makes. In the class, Rav Kahana raises a question. And the question, remarkably enough, seems to show that Shemuel was um, incorrect. And, but what's remarkable is that the question against Shemuel, here's the great conundrum. And I want you to understand this, so listen to me carefully. The great conundrum presented by the yeshiva is as follows. On the one hand, we would, we would be led to believe that Shemuel overlooked our Mishnah. That itself would be remarkable and unbelievable. I mean, to think that the Emorah Shemuel would somehow overlook a Mishnah is simply unfathomable. But to make matters worse, the Mishnah that Shemuel supposedly overlooked is actually alluded to in the statement of Shemuel. So what is going on here? Okay, that's the remarkable part. So, but nobody can crack the code. Nobody can figure it out. And it takes until Rava, the Rosh Yeshiva Mechoza, which was two generations later, to figure out what is going on here. Now, I want to tell you before we even continue that there's two versions to this story. We are reading one version of the story. The version of the story that we are reading is actually not going to be the version that is finally accepted as the correct version. Nevertheless, it's irrelevant. It's an important version of the story. The Gemara brings it when the Ravena and Rav Asher edited the Gemara. They knew what they were doing. So don't worry about the Gemara bringing us a redundancy. It's not redundant. It's an important version of the story. But I just want you to see the great conundrum. The conundrum being Shemuel is refuted by a Mishnah which he himself alludes to. So you can't tell me he didn't know this Mishnah. That would be a ludicrous statement. And yet, the Hakamim couldn't figure it out. Okay, but this is important, and maybe I'll switch, you know. Uh, you know, sometimes, like, we have classes and we have questions. It's okay to ask questions if they're valid questions, if they're questions that are well substantiated and well founded. Um, I recently gave a class about the philosophy of Harav Kuk. Harav Kuk was one of the great early uh, rabbis in the early state of Israel, even before the state of Israel. He was Harav Abraham Kuk. He was very fundamental to a lot of the development of, 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 um, of, of the state of Israel and, and a lot of the ideas. And in my class, I asked some questions, and, and I think the questions were great, and, I, and I, I believe in the questions. And I disagreed with the statement made by Harav Kuk, right? And what the Gemara teaches us is that if you have a well-founded question, the answer isn't, oh, how dare you ask that question? This is Shemuel, the Talmud of Rabbeinu HaKadosh, and Rosh Hashirav Nehal Dehan. Who are you to ask a question against him? No. If the question is well-founded, if the question is well-articulated, and most importantly, it's substantiated properly, then the question must be answered, right? You can't just ignore a well-founded question, right? So the answer that he's a gadol, he's greater than us, we just don't see, we can't understand, all that from the perspective of rabbinic thinking is nonsense. It's really important that we know because we hear, we hear so much of that, right? You know, who are you? Who is that? You know, that's that's, that's just irrelevant. It's not it's not the way hachamim, not rabbis. I'm not talking about rabbis. It's not the way hachamim think. 
It's not the way the Chachmei HaGemara thought. It's not the way Chachmei the Geonim thought. It's not the way Chachmei Andalus thought. Yes, there were those who thought and spoke like that, rabbis, but that's not the way of the Masoret we received from Moshe Rabbeinu. The Masoret we received from Moshe Rabbeinu is even Shemuel, the great Shemuel, the great expert in Dinei Mamonot. You have a question? Address it. You can't answer it? Then just say, I can't answer it. I don't have an answer. It happens to be in this case, there is an answer, and it's a very good answer. Okay, but I wanted to show you the methodology because the methodology is great. It's really important. Okay. Let's continue. So that's a question. And now that I introduced you that Rava was a Rosh Yeshiva of Mechoza, and he was a fourth generation of Emoraim, you understand this question was hanging for two entire generations. And here is here is the answer of Rabba. Um, and it's it's highlighted in the um, Zafaria, and I'm going to just take a ruler, put it on my desk so I can find it as well. What is the situation that our Mishnah is dealing with? Acha b'may asekinan. When our Mishnah says that the edim zomemim do not have to pay the entire value of the note, but rather they have to pay the brokerage fee for securing a new note, then malve al hamashkon uv moser shetalotav lebedin. One, there are two ways to interpret the Mishnah. One way to interpret the Mishnah is malve ala mashkon. The second way to interpret the Mishnah is moser shetarotav levetin. You have to understand that the vav... Is the share screen? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Here we go. So, be malve ala mashkon, uv moser shetarotav levetin. You have to understand that in, in, in Hebrew and in Aramaic, this vav can be either and right? That's one possibility. Or it can be or. In this case, it means or. So, is one possibility. is the second possibility. Let me explain to you what these two possibilities are. One possibility is is as follows. Let us say that there is a debt outstanding for $1,000. And at the time that the debt was entered into, the debtor gave the lender a lien on one of his assets. Let's say he has a land, a field worth $1,000. When the Shemitah comes, the debt is not annulled. Why is the debt not annulled? Well, somebody tell me, why is the debt not annulled? We said that the whole reason for the Shemitah annulling loans is because we don't want financial oppression. Lo yigos. But in this case, there is no financial oppression because the field, once there is a security interest in the field in favor of the lender, the lender is considered to be the owner of that field. So should the loan, not, if the loan is paid back, then the security interest is released and the field goes back to the original owner, right? But the idea here is that because the field is already encumbered by the security interest of the lender, there's no financial oppression. It's his field. That field was designated as the method through which the loan would be paid back. So therefore, when the Shemitah comes, the Shemitah does not annul the loan, right? So... When the Edim Zomimim, let's look at the case of the Edim Zomimim. The Edim Zomimim come to court, they say there's a thousand dollar loan. Defendant says, yes, there's a thousand dollar loan. The Edim Zomimim say, yeah, but you have to pay him back in 30 days. Defendant says, no, it's not true. I have to pay him back in 10 years. And let's add to the story that everybody agrees that when the loan was taken out, there was a security interest placed on the, on the field of the uh, debtor, the defendant. 
Therefore, in this case, the testimony of the Edim that he has to pay back in 30 days is not so devastating. It's not devastating because even though it's a 10-year loan, when the Shemitah comes in the seventh year, it's not going to annul the loan. Why is it not going to annul the loan? Because it's a security interest in the field. And as we said, one of the cases is um, in this case, the Shemitah is not mashmit, and therefore the Mishnah says, how do we assess the damages that the Edim Zomimim would have caused to the um, defendant? The answer is, the damages are on the amount of the brokerage fee that the defendant would need to pay in order to secure a new loan for 10 years, okay? That's one way to explain the Mishnah. So we explain the Mishnah in a way which is aligned with the statement of Shemuel. Shemuel said the, the Shemitah annuls the loan. The Mishnah seems to imply that the Shemitah does not annul the loan. And the answer is, the two statements are actually aligned. Yes, the Shemitah annuls the loan like Shemuel says it does. The Mishnah was talking about a case where the Shemitah walls don't apply because there is a security interest in an asset. It's a securitized loan and the Shemitah never annuls securitized loans. That's one way to reconcile the statement of Shemuel, Shemuel with our Mishnah. We just have to wait till the fourth generation of Emoraim to get that one. And then the second possibility is, um, One second. Right. Um, let me explain to you what Mosev Shetarotav Levetin means. It means as follows. Normally, when a person takes a loan, let's say he has a note, the promissory note, the, uh, the lender takes a promissory note. Um, um, when the loan is paid back, the lender will uh, give the promissory note back to the, uh, to the debtor. Okay, very good. One possibility that could be, uh, that was actually practiced, and I will explain this in a moment. What time is it? Okay, good. Baruch Hashem, we're good. One possibility is to be moser shetarotav, the shetarotav, the notes. You can surrender your notes to the court, to the betim. Why? You want these notes to be executed. You want them to have legal uh, standing. You want to collect on them. But what does the Torah say? The Torah says when the Shemitah comes, lo yigos, it's forbidden to oppress your friend financially. Lo yigos et re'ehu. But here's the thing. The law of lo yigos et re'ehu does not apply to the bet din. The law of lo yigos applies between one person and another person. So if a person surrendered the note to the court and told the court, I want you to act upon this note, he has a right to do that. He doesn't have to do that, but he may do that. So if a person surrenders his, uh, the note, um, one second, right. If a person surrenders the note to the bet din, then the bet din even when the Shemitah comes, the notes are not annulled and they are fully actionable. So the Shemitah will not annul those notes. So another way to explain the Mishnah is to say that the situation was that the Edim came, they said the defendant owes $1,000, it has to be paid back in 30 days. The actual um, term of the note, as it turned out, was actually 10 years. And the lender surrendered the notes to the bet din, and therefore the Shemitah would not have annulled the notes, would not have annulled the debt, and therefore the real damage to the defendant was the amount of money we would have had to pay a broker to secure himself a new loan for a 10-year term. So those are two ways to explain the Mishnah in a way that is aligned with Shemuel. Okay?
I want to give you a little more background about this idea of surrendering the note to the Betin. I want to explain to you what that's about. You've probably heard of the famous Piroz Bol. Piroz Bol that was instituted by Hillel Hazaken. In the days of Hillel Hazaken, this is during the days of the Bet HaMikdash, um, there was a situation where people did not want to lend money to those in need because they were concerned that those in need would not pay them back and the Shemitah would come and the Shemitah would annul the loan. So Hillel instituted the famous Peros Bol. Um, and I want to explain what this Peros Bol is about. There, there, there's many of the great scholars, um, for example, Alava Shalom, Professor Saul Lieberman, um, uh, there was also a famous professor, uh, Ginsburg, I think Louis Ginsburg, if I'm not mistaken. And there were other great scholars, and also many of the hachamim, many of the hachamim. They say, what is a pedos bol? What, 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 what is that about? You know, so pedos bol is, again, you surrender the notes to the betting. Well, 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 why should that work? Why, why do we say that in that case, it's not oppression? He's still being oppressed. I mean, the person owes the money and then the Bedin is coming after him and he's got to pay the money. I mean, he is being oppressed, notwithstanding my attempt to, you know, massage the issue of about 10 minutes ago, I did that. But let's, let's be real. The guy's being oppressed. He has to pay back the money. So why did they put his bold work? So many of the scholars, many of the hachamim, rabbis, explain that there's a special law of hefker, betin hefker. Hefker betin hefker means that the betin has a right to annul a person's property ownership rights in any given asset for whatever reason. And there's different applications of the law of hefker betin hefker. So these rabbis and scholars, great scholars, by the way, um, I, I only mentioned their name in great kavod. These rabbis and scholars, they said this is an example of hefker betin hefker. Really, the notes should be annulled on the shevi but because the Bedin has this sort of extra rights when it comes to property, they can say that they're not going to be annulled. That, that's, that's, the, that's the approach that they take. And many, many of the rabbis take this approach. My father, Allah Shalom, Hareni Kaparat Mishkavo, he doesn't take that approach. He does not take that approach. My father... Um, takes a completely different approach. And um, in general, my father never liked loopholes. He does not like loopholes. I know we talk about loopholes. Is there a loophole in the law? You know, when we're talking about Torah, the Torah is holy. My father does not, did not, and does not, <laughs> and never liked loopholes. You know, if some of you may know that I myself, for example, am not a big fan of selling Hamas on Pesach. You may have seen my videos on YouTube about the subject. I don't like loopholes. The Torah says, Tashbitu se'on mi batechem, get rid of the Hamas. That's my opinion. Get rid of the Hamas. Okay. Uh, there's an opinion on Shemitah. One of the big challenges in the state of Israel is when the Shemitah comes around, people don't know what to do because the Shemitah laws apply. They apply the Rabbana, but they apply. So how can you buy fruits? If you're in Israel and you want to buy fruits, in the supermarket, I can you buy fruits on the Shemitah years. So one approach is a loophole. They have an approach to sell the land of Israel to, to an Arab. My father, again, was opposed to this. It's haram, first of all, it's haram to sell the state of Israel to, to, to a goy. And, you know, you're selling the whole state of Israel to an Arab. Really, I mean, if the Arab now decides to kick everybody out, are we all leaving the state of Israel? But it's a loophole. It's not real. And, okay, it's... So I'm just giving you this whole introduction because surely, getting back to the Peros Bol of Hillel, there must be a better explanation than just to say it's a loophole or hefkeb betin hefkeb. And I want to give you the better explanation. It is based on Harambam. And here it is. The laws of Shemitah are the Oraita laws. So when we have the law of Shemitat Kesafim, the law that loans are annulled on the Shemitah year, that's a Deoraita law. The loans must be annulled. 
there was a similar law of Shemitat Karkaot. The law of Shemitat Karkaot applies every 50 years, not every seven years. It applies in the Jubilee year. The laws of Shemitat Karkaot are also that if a person goes into debt for whatever reason, he needs to sell the family estate. Hold on one moment. He needs to sell the family estate, he needs to sell the, the field, he needs to sell the family land. At the Jubilee year, the land goes back to the original owner. So it will come back to him. That's called the law of Shemitat Karkaot. Again, the Jewish economic system is unique. Mark my words. I don't need to be an economist to tell you that the minute the state of Israel, they have a lot of problems in the state of Israel, demonstrations, all the time, now the demonstrations are getting worse, people frustrated, people angry, people. The minute the state of Israel decides to just do an experiment, just try follow, just try it. Try following the Torah legal system. Try following the economic system of the Torah. Implement the Shemitah laws, implement all those laws. You will see how they will, the Israel will turn into paradise on planet Earth. But okay, I know that I'm in the minority and nobody's gonna take my advice. But one day in the future, they will look at this video and they will remember it. Amen. So, nevertheless, so you have these two laws. Now, these two laws are interconnected. I will tell you how the two laws are interconnected. Shemitat Kakot happens once every 50 years. Shemitat Kesafim happens once every seven years. But the interconnection is as follows. The law, the Oraita. The laws of Shemitat Kesafim only apply if the laws of Shemitat Karkaot apply. If the laws of Shemitat Karkaot do not apply, then the laws of Shemitat Kesafim don't apply either. It's part of an entire economic system. You can't take part of the economic system and not the other part. Okay, so when do the laws of Shemitat Karkaot apply? The answer is the laws of Shemitat Karkaot apply when all the Jews live in Israel, when the Shevatim return to Israel, and when they divide the land of Israel between the different Shevatim, right? Like we had in Terashat uh, Pinehas. Oh, also Perashat, um, uh, we just read Perashat Natot. Af Begoral, right? When they, um, um, uh, Perashat Vasem, when they divide the land of Israel among the Shevatim, then the laws of Shemitat Karkaot will once again apply. So that means that today we have Shemitah in Israel, but is it the Oraita or the Rabbanan? It's the Rabbanan. There's no law of Shemitah Karkaot. If there's no law of Shemitah Karkaot, the law of Shemitah is the Rabbanan. Okay. So why do we do it today? The Rabbanan. There's a famous Talmudic statement, and this applies in so many issues of Jewish law. The, the statement is, Him Amru, the him amru. Remember that statement. We'll probably repeat it a bunch of times. Him amru. The him amru. What does it mean? Him amru. Him amru. Why is it that we have shemitat kesafim today? It's rabbinic. Him amru. They told us. The hakamim told us. Today we're going to have shemitat kesafim. No loans are going to be annulled in the seventh year. The oraita there is no shemitat kesafim. But him amru. The rabbis told us to do it. So we're doing it. We do it, of course. Behem amru. So when the rabbis tell us to do something, they can also limit and delineate what they're saying. Since the whole law is the Rabbanan and it's the rabbis who are telling us to do it, the rabbis can also say it. In this circumstance, you do it. In that circumstance, you don't do it. Let's now look at the Pedal's ball. The Pedal's ball is the Rabbanan. What gives the Hakamim the right to say, give the Shetaro to the Betin, give your note to the Betin, and the Betin will collect the note? What gives them the right to say that? And the answer is, the Oraita, there is no Shemitah. The Oraita, this poor person who took the loan, he has zero protection. He's completely exposed. He's going to pay back the loan. The Oraita, the uh, lender can come after him, and there's no Shemitah, there's no seventh year, there's no nothing. But him, Amru, the Hachamim said, you know what? Uh, we'll do Shemitah Kesafim. Give, give, give him a break. Give him a break. No, it's not good. We don't like it. But at the same time, 
we will also give the lender the opportunity to give the shetal to the betin. And by giving the shetal to betin, if he chooses to do that, he will be able to collect on the loan. You understand the law of hem amru? Hem amru. That's the way Harambam explains the sugya. That's the way my father explained the sugya. That makes sense. There's no loophole. There's no ifkar betin. Not that ifkar betin is not a legitimate um, um, approach. It's a very legitimate, legitimate approach because it's a, correct, it's a correct law. But the approach of Harambam is far more precise because it's dealing with specific laws that 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 are a sui generis to the to the um, to the shemitah yovel uh, system, and that's what I like about this so much. And that's 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 why I wanted to really explain this to you, um, so you understand it uh, fully. Nevertheless, um, the conclusion is that um, wow. The conclusion is actually fascinating. So think of it, just for a second. Let's just take a step back. So look at our Mishnah again, just for a second. So what, ha- what happened in our Mishnah? We had this 10-year loan, right? The 10-year loan, and the Adim Zomimim came and said, no, no, it's a 30-day loan. Okay, look what happened. Shemuel, he makes a statement. The statement doesn't seem to be related to the Mishnah except for the fact that he uses the, the, the idea of a 10-year loan again, not coincidentally. Shemuel knew exactly what he was doing. So what was he doing? What was Shemuel doing? What was he alluding to, right? So Shemuel makes a statement because he knew that eventually people will understand. He, he obviously was a super, super brilliant, brilliant you know, mind. He understood that one day, it took four generations, but they, they, got, they got it. One day, they will ask the question, how can Shemuel say that the Shemitah doesn't, I'm sorry, does annul a 10-year loan? The Mishnah seems to intimate otherwise. And then they would reach the answer that they reach. That's, that's this version of the story. That's it. That's it. We have four minutes. With the four minutes that we have left, I'm going to now give you version B of the same exact story. Version B. And version B starts with the words, Ika de Amre. Ika de Amre means there are those who bring the story in a different way. Ika de Amre. And I want to give you the following Kelal. When you have a version, version A, and then you have an Ika de Amre, version B. The Halakha and the Ikar is like the Ika de Amre. That's a Kelal. That's a Kelal. Um, now let's look at this structurally before we even look at the content. And I think by the, by, for the three minutes we have left, we'll be able to do the structure. Structurally speaking, the first version of the story had three players. There was Shemuel, Rabbi Udama Shemuel, that was number one. Then you had the Metivi of Rav Kana. He was the second player. And then you had the statement of Rava. He was the third player. And there's a relationship between these players. Rav Udan, the name of Shemuel, makes a statement. Rav Kahana comes to sort of um, um, question the statement. And the question is really good. It takes two generations to answer that question. And who offers the answer? The third player, Rava. Rava offers that answer. The Ika de Amre has the same three players, but the relationship between the players changes. Okay? In the Ika de Amre, Rav Kahana doesn't come to question Shemuel. It appears that he comes to support Shemuel. Okay? He comes to support Shemuel. So you say, well, if in the Ika de Amre, Rav Kahana comes to support Shemuel, then what do I need Rava for? In the first version, Rav Kahana comes to question Shemuel, and Rava comes to say, oh, I can defend Shemuel. Okay, that I can understand, right? You need three players. But if in the second, in the Ika de Amre, in version B of the story, 
if Rav Kahana is not coming to question Shemuel, he's coming to support Shemuel, why do I need Ravai anymore? I don't need him. You understand? So I want you to learn how to look at things structurally because in my classes on the Golden Doves, I speak about structuralism. The Hakamim thought in terms of structuralism, right? So you remember I, I brought in the uh, Golden Doves. I brought Ferdinand de Saussure, Roman Jacobson, and other great structuralist thinkers. Structuralism in the Western world, none of you, none of us, not me, not you, not, none of us are taught to think in terms of structuralism. We think more in terms of Aristotelian logic, which is a completely different way of, of, of seeing the world. But Aristotelian logic is in conformance with our linguistic structures. We, the language processes our brain and therefore what we call logic, and I, I gave yesterday a video about logic, there's no such thing as logic. Logic is just a particular mode that the brain, brain uses. It appears logical to the person speaking that language because your brain was structured through that language. So that's why it appears logical. So we all think Aristotelian logic is, is logical because our brains are structured like that, but that's just a fortuitous circumstance, right? So structuralism, is a different way of viewing things, right? And, 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 and please do get online and look at my videos on the Golden Doves. But the point is that I first wanted to break down the structure of these two parts. Now that I've broke down the structure, we can look at the content, but that's gonna have to wait till next week because next week uh, I see the time has come. Nevertheless, I will take a question. I see that Eddie is raising his hand. So Eddie, you are free now to ask a question if you still have a yes. question. Uh, thank you, Robert. So my question is, is there any distinction between uh, and Moses Bedin, or are they the same thing? The same thing. The you institution the of the, yes, correct. That's a good question. The institution of Pirozbo is predicated upon the idea of being Moser Shetavotada Bedin. Absolutely correct. Yes. Okay. And also, sorry, if, if I can ask a follow up, I don't know if anyone else has a question they want to get in, but. Um, so was there any, I know nowadays they say, oh, just fill out this form and then they'll do the pros bowl for you. But, you know, sort of, I guess, quote unquote, in the old days, was there ever a time when the Beit Din would uh, reject the pros bowl, say, and say, sorry, we're not doing this for you? Or was it sort of automatic as it is today? I mean, first of all, that's a great question. I right. don't know. I didn't study the history of pros bowl. Generally speaking, it should not be a problem for a lend, um, uh, yeah, a lender, a creditor, to take his promissory note and to give it to the betin, it has to be done properly. It has to be an act of mesira uh, to the betin. But it, I, I don't see why that should be challenging. It's not like chames, where you know the whole thing is actually farcical and it doesn't follow Jewish law at all because it's just you know they, the, the, nobody knows what they're selling, what they're buying. You know, uh, there was actually a, a very kind of well, I don't want to say humorous, it would, you know, it's sad, but if I was, you know, not Jewish, it would be humorous that the goy they were selling the chames to the state of Israel for many, many years actually ended up he was Jewish. Um, but it, it didn't make a difference because the whole sale was a farce anyway. Sure. It didn't really matter that he was Jewish or Arab, but it just was kind of, for me at least, it was a subject of, I said, maybe one day a comedy movie in the Yomot Mashiach, but I don't believe there'll be TV then anyway. So that's, uh, that's not going to happen. Um, any other questions? Sorry, I got just uh, uh, one yeah. more follow up. Please. So the so the halacha uh, that Moser shetarot of the betin and mashmitin that would only apply when shemitla is the rabbanan, right? Meaning when shemitla is the oraita, there's no way to get out of uh, Moser shetarot of betin is is in absolutely in correct. Okay. Once the shemitla applies the oraita, there is no more peros bol. It's over. There is no more financial oppression. Of the poor, Shemitah comes, that's it. They start over again. Thank you. Uh, if, if the Shemitah, like if it's Doraita again, we still have the way of, of collecting collateral. So you can't do Peros Bol, you can still collect collateral. Because 100%, 100% correct. Meaning, if now the Mashiach came and all the Shevatim are sitting in Eretz Yisrael, inshallah soon, and now somebody wants to lend money and they don't want the Shemitah to annul it, they can, they, then they should be careful to only make the loan where they have a security interest against a, against a specific asset. 
because that's not considered financial oppression because in this case, there's an actual asset that you're holding, right? So basically it's, 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 more, it's more akin to a sale than a conditional sale than to a loan because in this case, he actually has an asset. And why don't you sell the asset yourself and take the money? Oh, you don't want to sell the asset. Okay, so you're gonna give it to the lender. So it's kind of like a sale, conditional sale, which when the loan comes, it'll be undone, right? It's, it's, so it's not, it's not financial oppression anymore. That's just business. You know, you, you want to sell the field, don't want to sell the field. You need the money, you sell it. That's an arms length transaction. That's not the logos that the Torah is talking about. Thank you. Of course. Gentlemen, always a pleasure. Billy Ned, I think next week, are we, no, I think next week is Tish uh, No, uh, no, 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 no. Mechila, that's Parashat Tashvah. So Billy Ned, next week we will study. Have a good night. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.